Welcome to GIA Deep Dive in 45 minutes, another GIA session. As you have seen, I think we have them uh, like a four so far in the GIA workshop. Uh, the workshop that I've delivered on a first pre-conf day actually uh, was mostly focused on uh, theory and, and slides. And today we will focus more on a demo and I will show you how to do it, but I will also explain what are the steps and what is actually happening when we do that. So what are the potential problems that you can encounter during that? And uh, that's it. So uh, my name is Alexander Nikolic, if you don't know me, and you can find me on Twitter as uh, Alexander. I will start this in the same way as a, as, a, as a workshop with that definition that it's kind of a the simplest one that I found, but it still looks okay for official documentation kind of thing, that just enough administration or GIA is a security technology that enables delegated administration for anything that can be managed with PowerShell. Okay. So let's turn that into a language that anyone can understand. So GIA enables non-admins to run admin tasks. So what's the problem that we are facing is a huge number of admins in our organizations, right? Uh, users or just our colleagues, they need to perform certain tasks. Those tasks ask for higher privileges and how we solve that in a way that we don't like it, but we cannot avoid it. We give them local admin rights or we give them just rights that are just highly privileged and we don't like that, right? So we need to kind of a decrease that number, to reduce the number of people that have admin rights without actually affecting them so that they can still perform the tasks that are needed, okay? GIA makes sense only when it's the only entrance to a machine. If you spend a lot of time configuring a proper GIA endpoint, but you allow your users to RDP to your machine, do you think that GIA is a solution for you? If you have any other way for them to connect, if you allow them to locally, interactively log into machine, is GIA a solution for you then? It's not. So the only way for them to go into your machine, to manage that machine, needs to be GIA endpoint. Okay. Everything else works against GIA, so all your work is actually useless. Okay. And one more point here. GIA won't protect you from your admins. Okay? Because they can find their way, because usually on your machines, you will have also unprotected session configurations, default one for your admins. They can use that as well, right? They can always find a way. So if you have your local users in your machines, on your, in your environment, end users, and they have local admin rights, do you think again that GIA is a solution for you? No. They can change it, right? So. GIA would not protect you from admins. And let's now move to a demo, okay? Demo will be performed in my test domain in Azure. I have a domain controller, a member server there, and the machine that it's also server but works as my admin client. Everything that I will do, I will do remotely. So I want to show you that it's possible to set up GIA endpoint remotely. When you look at documentation, when you look at the blog post, when you look at most of the other sessions, how people are creating endpoint locally on machine that is the target for, right? So I would like to show you that it's possible to do that remotely without touching interactively with the login directly that target uh, that remote machine, okay? The idea for uh, this endpoint is uh, one of that's mostly used for demo purposes. Also, Microsoft is using it a lot to show you how to enable your DNS admin to perform their tasks on domain controller. Okay. Without GIA, 
what kind of rights they would need to have so that they can restart DNS service, look at the DNS uh, log events, perform certain tasks to clear the cache and all the other stuff. You will need to give them admin rights on your domain controller, which is extremely dangerous, right? They don't need it and you don't want to give them, right? So let's start interactive session to the main controller. And then we will talk about a planning phase. Okay, let me just close on this thing. So in a planning phase, and that's probably the most important phase when you think about creating a GI endpoint is that uh, you need to think together and work together with people that will execute those remote tasks, what are their needs? What they need to perform on those machines, okay? And that's not easy process, right? They first need to know what they are doing. They need to give you information, what they usually do, what are the tasks that they perform, right? So once when you get that, and in this case, we have checking DNS uh, server state, creating, reading, updating uh, DNS records, clearing server cache. So there's a number of tasks there. Looking at uh, event logs for DNS related uh, events. And once when you get that, then you need to map that somehow to commands. We can map that to partial commandlets, but we can also map that to native command line tools, right? In this, at this point, we will not talk about GUI tools, right? We cannot create GI endpoint for GUI tools. So we need to think about all those command line tools that can perform those tasks. We should focus on PowerShell commandlets from a simple reason that on PowerShell commandlets, we can have a full control on the parameters that we want to allow and parameter values that we want to allow. If you pick a command line tool to expose in your GIA endpoint, you usually have a problem with that. The reason for it is that very often command line tools are there to support a little bit different scenarios, not just reading data, but very often if they change a parameter or switch, they can also change something. Yeah. Or certain command line tools are great for reading data, but they also can allow to change the state on, on, on things, right? I will give you an example of one of those. So better idea is to actually try to find the PowerShell commandlet that it's equivalent to that command line utility, if it exists, or to write your own PowerShell function that will be a wrapper around that command line utility. Because then you will again have a full control on the parameters and the behavior of that command line utility. Okay. So let's look at the list of the potential command line utilities and the PowerShell command list that we can use to enable DNS admins or DNS operators on our domain controller. So for example, DNS CMD exe can be one, but as I said, that can allow you also to change something. So you need to be careful and maybe that's not the best idea to expose it directly. There's a DNS server, so you need to look what's available there. If you recognize that you have multiple roles that needs to perform something with your DNS server, then you will kind of start separating the tasks that belong to those roles. So you might have just someone who needs to be able to view DNS related things, okay? To check the status of a service or DNS event logs without changing anything. That can be one role. And then we can have a role of a DNS admin, the guy who can be responsible for doing everything that it's needed with a DNS reading stuff, changing things as well. Okay, so then we already have in design, we have recognized that we have two different roles and we will use that knowledge once when we start working on a role capability for our 
GI endpoint. Uh, we can, for example, if you want to uh, restart a service, we have a choice. We can use a net, next, uh, net exe for it, or we can use restart server for it. So what do you think is a better tool for our GIA endpoint? What can happen if we expose net exe? We can also, that user then can use it to add himself to a certain groups. Do we want to see that in our environment? No. With the restart server, uh, restart service, we can actually just pick a few parameters that are needed and we can also limit the services that can be restarted actually. So, because this is the DNS guy, he needs to be able only to restart DNS service. Okay. We have that granular control that we can go directly just to a value that it's allowed for a parameter. Then for get win event, do we want those guys to have access to all event logs on our system? No. So for that guy, you can create your own function that will work only against DNS related event logs and allow them to read those values there. Otherwise, you can expose information that it's not needed and also not wanted to be exposed to those users that are just there to work with DNS. You can imagine what kind of a resource, uh, what kind of information you have in the event logs on your do domain controller, right? So for that kind, of, we will write a simple custom function as a wrapper for get win event. When we think about uh, those wrapper functions, we need also to think about are they really kind of a simple so they can be part of a configuration or we will have a number of them and then the best practice is to package them as a module and then expose that module that contains your own custom functions in your GIA endpoint. Your module will be treated as a Microsoft modules or third party vendor modules. There is no any difference. Okay. So if you write something that it's more complex than just a couple of lines of a function definition, package all that in a module and put it in a proper location. The proper locations for it are those that can be discovered thanks to a path in PS module path environment to variable. We have a question here. Can I put it in system or where should I? Okay. So as you know, when you look at the content of PS module path environment to variable, by default you see three paths. One leads to your own, uh, let's say, module repository in your uh, PS ho uh, in your home, and then documents Windows PowerShell backslash modules, and they put your modules there. Then you have one for uh, system modules in installation folder for PowerShell, and then since PowerShell 4, we have a new one that goes into program files Windows PowerShell modules that it's then available to all users of your machine. So that's the best location for those modules that will participate in GIA endpoint, right? You don't want that to have only for you, like right? you want to expose that to other users that will connect, okay? Don't put your modules in folder for system modules. You can do that, but that's really bad practice. It's not, system without reason, right? So after the planning phase, we need to start building our role capabilities, okay? There are certain rules that we need to follow there, especially about the path that needs to be used for them. They need to be wrapped in a subfolder called role capabilities that it's inside of a proper definition of a module. You don't actually need to create the module, but you need to create that folder structure and module manifest for it, okay? If you have a module, you can also put your custom functions there, but that's not requirement. 
but it's required to have that role capabilities subfolder. Otherwise, the creation process is not able, the PowerShell is not able to create it for you because he could not find it. Be careful not to make a mistake there or typo when you use it. We have two questions. So the first question is, Yes, yes, you can. Okay. So you will have everything in just one yeah. module together, the functions that you want to expose and the role capabilities file. And then you don't have to specify them in the role capabilities file, the, uh, You always, you just wait for a second, you always need to expose uh -huh. and tell, those are the things that I want to be visible. Okay. So we will talk about that. to a network path. I would not recommend that, but for during the creation, because at the time of creation, you are the admin of machine that creates the endpoint. I, my kind of a best practice suggestion will be to create internal PowerShell repository that looks like a powershellgallery.com and fetch the modules that are needed from your internal repository to that machine, properly install it where it's needed, and then use that. Because when you want to load it, you will just make your life more complicated. And you will need to take about security of that network share and all the rights. And I haven't tried it. I don't even know if it works. But in general, try to have everything configured on your machine. It's much better and easier actually to maintain. So let me do some creation here. Uh, I need to define first the module path. So I'm uh, creating a module called GROs. I will create it module. And then I will create new module manifest here for that module, just defining description. I presume that you all are aware what the module manifests are. They are just data files with some metadata in it. Then I will need to create a role capability file. You cannot be creative here. That subfolder needs to have a name, role capabilities, okay? Not my role capabilities or DNS role capabilities or any of those, right? Let's create that one. And now, uh, here, because you can see that I'm working with a really simple function, I will create here a body of a function, the definition of that function, and assign it to a variable that I will use later in my configuration. It's not needed to be like this, but I just pick that way. So I have here DNS event function definition variable, that it's a hash table that contains the name of my custom function, and then the script block of it. So this function here will, at the end, create get DNS server log function that allow you to go into Microsoft Windows DNS server service log and get some events from it. Uh, by default, you will get only 100, but you can change it if you want, okay? Then I will create another one for demo purposes. So this one will not be needed actually for GI endpoint that you will create in your organization. This is something that I want to create so that I can show you what are the identities that we use when we work with GI endpoint, okay? So what I'm doing here, I'm creating a new function called get user info. And inside of it, I will run two things. I will look into a content of a PS sender info variable that's the variable that exists only in a remoting context, okay? So if you just open your PowerShell right now and type PS sender info, what you will get is nothing. But if you run it inside of evoke command, script block, or interactive session that you have opened, then you will get some content there, okay? I can just show you that even here, like if we run PS sender info here, this is what I'm getting. Those are the information that you get. We will focus on this connect user, connected user, and run as user properties. 
And because I'm also, I was, I discovered during the, this preparation that uh, I'm not very happy with the output that I will get with that one. I added one more command that will give me some additional information, and that's uh, who am I? Okay. So the who am I will give me information about user and about also some uh, group membership there. So that's part of my uh, get user info function. As I've decided to create two roles, one for viewers of DNS settings and one for DNS admins, now I'm using splatting feature to create preparation for actual role capability creation. At the end of this, I will have two role capability files, one for viewers, one for admins. Okay? So now I have here parameters for a viewer. I need to define a path. I need to define visible commandlets, visible functions, and definition for functions if I define functions inside of a role capability file without loading them from a module. If I did this and put all those, those two functions in a module, I would not need this definition here immediately inside of a configuration. What you can see here is that we have two properties, visible commandlets and visible functions. What does that mean, just when you look at it, that you will need to know does your uh, command that you want to expose is commandlet or a function, right? Logically, when you see that we have two, one is supporting commandlets, one is supporting functions. When you look at the official documentation, they will also tell you that run get command against those that you want to expose to see if there are commandlets and functions. I discovered last week, actually, that uh, PowerShell doesn't care. So for PowerShell, during its, they don't check that. So you can actually put all, all the things that you need in visual, uh, visible commandlets, for example. I discovered that because I look at the GitHub repository for JIA, and they expose five different role capabilities file there for us to learn how to do it. And one of the role capabilities file there that it's created for sample purposes uh, by Microsoft IT has the definition for visible co commandlets, the name of a module backslash get dash star. And I look at the output of that and I realize that 16 of them are functions and only one is a commandlet. But when I generated GIA endpoint, all 17 were exposed. So I talked to a guy who is responsible for GIA in Microsoft, and he told me that actually they are not checking that anymore. Right? So it's kind of, but why? Because customers actually complain that it's hard for them to keep track on are they dealing with the functions or commandlets. So, question. for a definition or execution later? As what's exposed. Uh, what is exposed. Yeah, so like you did this one command, let's get either of them, or functions, whatever. Yeah. You just had it in there once, yeah. but you had both defined a command and a function. Which one would be so? So the best practice to avoid that kind of conflict would be to use fully qualified module name. No. Okay? To be sure what you're doing. Another point here is try to avoid wildcards, right? Because here, here, here is a scenario. You define your GIA endpoint using a wildcard. And at one point, the module that you are using for that definition contains 10 commands, commandless or functions, doesn't matter right now. And then they update that version the version of the module, and they introduce two new commands. So you're using the same role capabilities file on some other machines, thinking that you will expose those 10 that you had with the previous version that you tested, but you will actually get 12. Because you are targeting new version of that module on that new machine. Right? So there are consequences for using a wildcards. If you 
explicitly specify what you want to expose, then you have a full control on it. With the wildcards, not so much, okay? Try to avoid that. So even when you look at those sample rule capabilities uh, files created by Microsoft IT, you will see that they are using wildcards. And you look at the documentation, they said, don't try not to do that, try to avoid it. So you need to kind of a pick what it works best for you, but just be aware that with the wildcards, you might have some uh, unwanted uh, commands once when the version of a module changes. So let me create a role capability file here. And really? Hash table array for function definition. Okay. Let me see what is the format for it. Okay. So we will create now a, a new kind of a skeleton for just default yes, RC, just to see the format of it. Okay, let me read this. So they want me for function definitions to create, okay, for function definition, this is where we are, name and a script block. I, I didn't put it. I didn't, I missed that step. I just talked about it, but I didn't do it, right? This one, let me, this is the problem when you talk too much. Okay, thank you. Or we need to check. Now, thank you. So for, uh, admin role capability, we need to uh, do the same thing to define what we want to expose. So we need to create a path for a uh, role capability file for that role. And in this case, we will use visible commandlets to expose uh, all commands that are part of DNS server module. And then we will uh, of expose also restart service commandlet but only allowing name parameter to be and accept DNS as a value, okay? So that that user, when it connects, he cannot restart any other service. So we have admin. Yep. And now role capability for admins. Now that we have defined those two role capability files for two roles that we want to enable, we need to create session configuration. The job of session configuration is to define some state for that uh, GIA endpoint and also to do the mapping between the users that we want to allow and the roles that we want to assign to them. So we need to uh, pick location where to store configuration. This is kind of a, a temporary uh, storage for a configuration while we are working on it. You will see what happens once when we register that session configuration. Then uh, I created two groups in my domain. One is uh, GIA DNS viewers and one is GIA DNS admins. Why is it best practice to work with the groups because once when you want to add another and enable another user to participate and uh, connect to GIA endpoint, you don't need to change anything on that particular machine with the configuration of GIA endpoint. You will just add that user to that group and everything will that work for that new user from that point. Okay. Uh, you can see examples when they're doing it with the users, but group is always the best for that. So we need to define viewer group and admin group. Now I will uh, create that uh, GIA configuration folder that I want to use for storing my 
configuration. And then with the help of a splitting, now we will define session configuration parameters. For that, we need a path. We need to define a session type. When we work with GIA endpoint, the only session type that makes sense is restricted remote server. What will happen if we specify that value? By default, we will get, thanks to that setting, only eight proxy functions that are needed to support all different ways of PowerShell remoting. Interactive session, fan in and implicit. Okay. We are not talking about uh, fan out. Not, we are not talking about fan in because this is one that is based on WinRM setting and fan in is the one that is based on IIS known to exchange and exchange online guys or SharePoint guys. Right? Here we are talking about fan out, implicit and interactive. I will show you what are those eight a little bit later. Thanks to the strictly remote server setting, we will also set language mode to no language. We have full language mode, restricted language mode, constrained language mode, and no language mode. In my opinion, the only one that makes sense with GIA is a no language. My friend and partial security expert, Matt, told me that maybe restricted can be used to certain scenarios as well. He still haven't found any flaws in that kind of configuration. But I think it's just a matter of time for him to do that. So we need to wait. But no language, that's, that's the thing. What will happen actually if you constrain your endpoint in a way to you expose just five functions, but you set language mode to full language? What will be the result then of your configuration? A hackable endpoint. Because if you allow language mode to be full language, that means that you allow all pieces of PowerShell language to be used there, and one of them is a script block. If you have a script block enabled for users, they can run whatever they want inside of that script block just using call operators, over, uh, going over uh, uh, around your restrictions. So full language is a big no-no for custom endpoints, okay? Unless you won't allow your users to hack them, then you can pick that one, no problem. Works as a, in, in default uh, language. So the, the rules of no language, they don't apply to a content of your custom functions. All the commands inside your functions operate in default language mode, which is a full language. Okay? So your, those restrictions apply only outside of your functions. So if you want to assign, for example, result of your function to a variable, that will fail when the language mode is set to no language. Because variable assignment is not allowed. If you try to call some .NET types, that will also fail, and some other things. You can read all about language modes in about underscore language underscore modes document. I really suggest to you to do that. You don't need to do it during, the, during this uh, session, but a little bit later. So uh, what we have here also is a transcript directory. Best practices to record everything that it's actually executed once when user connects to your endpoint and performs some commands there. Okay, so don't miss that step. Create a transcripts folder and the transcripts will do, go there. I will show you what's recorded there and how it looks like. Then we are getting to very important property for setting run as virtual account. That's the one that came with GIA. Before GIA, it was possible for us to use something called now static run as credentials. That was the old way to delegate. But in those old days, the problem was that if you use run as credentials during the creation of your endpoint, 
you would need first to take care of credential management for or password management for that run as account. So in case that it changes, you will need to re-register your endpoint. That was an annoying part. But from security point of view, if you wanted to assign, for example, uh, to enable that endpoint to go to a, and communicate with the network resources, you will pick some domain accounts and you will pick some domain accounts with the high privileges. And from that point, you actually needed to treat that machine as a domain controller almost, depending on uh, rights that you assign to that run as user. Uh, that was okay for a couple of years, but then Microsoft realized that they have better solution. They can use virtual accounts for it. So when you say that virtual account equals true, that means once when you create GIA endpoint and you connect to that GIA endpoint as a non-admin, everything that you execute in that GIA endpoint actually runs in the context of a virtual account. What is the virtual account? If the GIA endpoint is defined on a member server or a workstation, virtual account is a member, is a local admin. That account is temporary. His lifetime is only duration of your connection to GIA endpoint. One, when you disconnect, that account doesn't exist anymore. In this case, when we use virtual account on domain controller, virtual account is the member of domain admins group. So that might sound very scary to you, right? But that's completely transparent to a user. And if you create a proper G account that works with controlled commands, he cannot actually leverage that power that virtual accounts gives to him, okay? There's also possibility to create and say run as virtual account groups. So if you don't want virtual account to be a member of a local administrators group, you can pick some other local security group if that group is and rights that are assigned to that group are enough for the functions that you and commands that you want to expose. Okay? So it's not that you are forced to give him the local admin rights. That's the easiest way. It works for most cases, but if you want to lower it, then you need to test, are your commands okay if that virtual account belongs to some other security group that it's not local uh, administrators group, okay? So it is possible to kind of lower that, but then you need to test every single one. If the virtual account is the local administrator, then you know that all commands will actually work without those additional testing, but you need to test anyway and audit whatever you're doing. And finally, we are going now to role definitions property, which is a hash table when we defined the users and as a keys and as the values, we define the actual role capabilities. How you reference to role capability you reference uh, using just the name of role capability file without PSRC extension. Thanks to this design that we have right now, you might recognize potential problems. What that can be? Can you guess? You cannot overwrite functions, but because you're referencing only to names of the role capabilities and no one stops you to have multiple role capabilities with the same name, what can happen? You will actually not know what's going on there because you will go into a search algorithm for the modules and they are part of the PS module path and then the PowerShell will find the first role capability with that name and use that one. Unfortunately, that's not, uh, the search algorithm doesn't give the same results every time. 
So you cannot be sure that, okay, it's alphabetically. So I know that even if I have two role capability files with the same name, I will always get the one that belongs to a module that starts with A. That's not the case. So the best practice, don't have role capability files with the same name. I expect this design to change in the future so that they will point actually to a path of role capability files then we will be sure what we are targeting, right? For now, it's kind of a non-deterministic what will happen. We have a question here. Yeah. Can we see uh, which uh, We can see what's part of an endpoint definition, and I will show you that, and we can see what are the capabilities assigned to a certain user. Uh, with a little bit of a script, we can also get the role definitions, but we will go through uh, all the modules, we will search for role capabilities file, we will go into those PSRC file, and then do the math there and get the results. So it's possible to, as a designer, kind of a, create a little bit of a function and give the, uh, get the list of all the role capabilities that you can use on the machine. You know? So it's not there by default. There is no command let, that will give you that let's say, get role capability dash available, and then you will get, uh, like for modules, you know, that get module list available, and then you get the list of the modules. It will be nice, actually, to have get PS role capability dash list available, and then to get that list. That's not a bad suggestion, actually, so someone can post that to user voice. Sounds pretty cool to me. So uh, let's define this session configuration parameters here and create a session configuration file. Now that I have that file, uh, I need to register session configuration. I need to register GIA endpoint. So I need to define a name and to point to a session configuration file. For that, I have a commandlet called register PS session configuration. That commandlet is with us actually since PowerShell 2, when they introduced PowerShell remoting. So, uh, GIA is... Wow, this is new. Processing data from a failure fully. That's not actually new. What happened is that I created the GIA endpoint and it needed to restart the VNM service during that work. So, a uh, piece of advice here, always read error messages. And don't panic. And if it's possible, have Matt in the audience that he can just help you with the suggestions. So, as you can see here, uh, what happened, and actually there is a piece of warning before everything saying that, okay, we need to restart the service uh, as well. And this is what happened, right? Uh, so now I have uh, that GI endpoint configured. The name is DNS uh, administration. What I want to show you now is what happened to a session configuration file during this registration process. As you remember, it was in a folder that I've created just for configuration part of the story. But when you register, it, it goes into a, one specific place, and that's in installation folder of PowerShell, you have a folder called session config. All your custom session configurations go there. Okay. So, and this one failed or I need to uh, enable, I need to go again to uh, my domain controller and get back to where was it? Here. So this is how it looks like one when it's actually applied and registration uh, is finished. So as you can see, uh, some good is added to original name of that file. Why that file is now stored in, let's say, secure location, system 32, standard user cannot read the data there, right? You need to have admin rights to do it. So that's, that's the thing 
Let's look at the properties for newly created GIA endpoint. When you look here now at this output, you can recognize a couple of new things that you might have not seen before you started working with GIA. They have a transcript directory. They have role definitions as a part of a session configuration uh, object. So you see here that this one has those two uh, roles, Re session type, and uh, what are the other things that are important, like security uh, SDDL permissions. Look what happened here. When you connect to default Mike, uh, default session configuration, what are the things that are happening there? You need to be the uh, member of local administrators group or member of remote management users group, right? You are connecting to default session configuration called Microsoft.PowerShell. As you can see, when GIA endpoint is created, permissions are changed. So admin domain admin or the local admin of that machine cannot actually connect to this GIA endpoint. Only users that we specified in a role definitions mapping are allowed to connect. They have full rights. I don't know why Microsoft decided to give them full rights because read and execute is enough. But they have actually full rights on ACL on that session configuration. Questions? Someone? We had GS session. As you can see, when you look at permissions, do you see domain admin there? Do you see local admins in case of a member service? You will not see them there. So they cannot use this GIA endpoint to connect. You still have that unconstrained default one at this point, right? But for GIA endpoint, you actually get permissions only for users or groups that you have defined in a role definition part of session configuration. Okay. Yes. Yes. So as you can see, when we look at permissions, we have here value that it's human, uh, humanly readable, right? It's for humans, but then we also have here the security SDDL. Uh, Microsoft added a new commandlet called convert from SDDL string, and then we need to do PS session configuration, DNS administration, and the name of the property. I can just copy it here. So this should give us a... So for discretion, we have DNS viewers, access allowed, DNS admins that we created, access allowed. Everyone failed. Group is building administrators and all this up, but we don't have the uh, actual uh, SDDL that it's original, that's the default one, right? So this is this is changed. But this is command that is very useful for this conversion, even when you design some things, because sometimes you will need to define your own SDDL string and then just to check it how, how it works when it transition. So, so far, we were creators of GIA endpoint, okay? But now I need to switch to a role of a user to see what is the experience when you are a user of a GIA endpoint. What are the options for you? So for that, I need first to disconnect myself from that domain controller. And to show you the different experience, because we have two different roles, I need credentials for DNS viewer. and credentials for DNS admin. So I will first connect to the main controller 
as viewer of DNS. So as you can see, to do that, you need to specify configuration name of a GIA endpoint. If you don't do that, what will happen? You will try to connect to default session configuration, Microsoft.PowerShell. You don't have permissions to do that, and the command will fail. So now, if everything works as I expect, we will get connection to the main controller as DNS member of the GIA DNS viewers group. Okay. What is exposed to us now? If I run get command, and get command is one of those eight default proxy functions that are created thanks to restricted remote server setting, I will get this list of commandlets. What you can see when you look at the list that we have all those get commands that are coming from DNS module. We have a couple of those default ones like clear host, exit PS session, get command. We have uh, get DNS server log, which is my custom function that I created for a user that so he can get information from DNS event log. And I have get format data, get help, measure object, out default, and select object that are part of those eight default ones. And I have get user info, which is my own custom made function. Okay. If I run get server log, I will get DNS events. That's what I want. It works. Let me show you or something about identity here. When we look at the output of my function, here we see the output of PS sender info. I think that something happened between PowerShell 5 and PowerShell 5.1 because before I'm pretty sure the result will be that connected user is DNS viewer and run as user is the actual virtual account. For some reason, the PS sender info doesn't show that but that's the reason why I added who am I. When you look at the output of who am I slash user, you will see that we are actually virtual account at the moment of execution. So we are connected as a DNS viewer domain account, but we are executing everything as a DNS user. The name for that uh, user is WinRM, VA for virtual account, underscore one for the first connection. If you repeat this connection using the same uh, connected user, it will increase that to two, three, four, so that you can, when looking at the logs, you can realize that someone tried three times to, to log in. And then you have underscore domain name, underscore the actual name of account. Right? So that's how they create the string for virtual account. We have a question. So uh, we have transcripts. That's one thing that we can set during the creation of uh, session configuration. And in PowerShell 5, we have a script block logging that we should enable. It's an optional feature, but highly recommended. And also module logging. So with transcripts and those two module and script block logging features, we are pretty much covered very nicely to get the full control of the things that are happening on our machines when someone connects to a GIA endpoint. As you can see here, I also wanted to output a group membership for a virtual account so that you can see, if you haven't believed me before, that it's domain member of domain admins. If we execute this on a member server or a workstation, then we will have here the built-in administrators group. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's exit this and let me show you how it looks like when we connect as DNS admin. If we connect with that user, then we will get more you can see here that we will get uh, much more of commands, not just get commands from DNS module, but some else. 
And here is the same thing, so I don't want to uh, spend time on that, but I want to show you that we have commandlet called PS session capability that can give you a list of commands that are exposed to a certain user account. Unfortunately, this commandlet doesn't work in a remote in context. You need to execute it on a local machine. Microsoft is aware of that problem and they will fix it in the next release, I hope. Okay. So if you want to check that, you need to go directly to that machine and then, then run it. Uh, there's one thing that, that it's also interesting here that for usage, the recommended way is to use implicit remoting. How implicit remoting works, we create a session to remote machine, then we import that session and then we work with those remote commands, they look like they are local. And we can combine them with a session in our commands in our local session. So if you, is, if you can see here, I don't have DNS server on my own machine. So I can create a session to domain controller using GI endpoint as a viewer. When the session is created, I can try to import it. I say I can try it because right now in this implementation, there is a bug, but there is also a workaround for it. And it will be also fixed in the next version. There is a problem with some of those default constraint commands that are part of GIA uh, configuration. So what you need to do, you need to get the list of all commands that are exposed and then to filter out those that are coming from default GIA configuration so that you're exposing only your things. So here I'm using this uh, remote server to get the filter. So if you see, we can programmatically get the list of all aliases and commands that are part of that restricted remote server setting, okay? And now I will filter them out so that I will get only mine. Once when I have that, I can actually import session targeting only my commands and then that will work, okay? So now the temporary module is created, all those fang uh, things are available, so if I run get user, because that's one that's interesting to me, if I run it here, I don't, didn't have it before on my machine, as you can see it's prefixed with GIA, this is what I picked, I'm getting these results from remote machine, but it looks like I'm executing everything locally, which is the beauty of implicit remoting. Uh, so uh, that's something that I wanted to to show you, there's one more thing, if you just allow me to uh, do that, because I think it's kind of a, a cool to show you that we have actually a built-in GUI for GIA endpoint when we work with PowerShell ISC. So see what is happening here. I will start show command add-on. That's the one that will give you right now list of all commands that are available on my local system. But look what happens when I try to create interactive session to domain controller using GIA endpoint. The list refreshes and I get now only commands that are available inside of a GIA endpoint. So, if I filter this out, not to get the DNS, you can see here that I'm getting those eight default ones and two of mine. If I pick, for example, a restart service, remember, I constrained that to run only with DNS. I go here, name, look at this. Isn't that awesome? And you just run it. So, you get for free a nice GUI for working with GIA endpoints. That's all from me for today for GIA session. Uh, if you have some questions, we can continue through the day. I will be here till the end of the day. Thank you for your time and I hope you enjoy the conference.